Welcome to Finding Stuff Out. My name is Robot Harrison. Do you want some microchips? They are my favorite food. No? Too crunchy? That's okay. I will serve you your first question. It's from Theron. When will I have my own personal robot? When will you have your own personal robot? Well, Theron, your question made me realize I want one too. And guess what? We're not alone. Check out this old movie I found. This is Rolo the robot, and his master is asking him to make dinner. Yes, ma'am. Rolo, get. People have been dreaming of a humanoid robot servant for a really long time. One that could cook meals, answer the door, vacuum the floor, and lots more. So when is it really going to happen? That's a lot to ask from a robot. Is it possible? Maya had a good question about what robots can do. Can a robot's brain store as much information as a human's brain? To answer your question, Maya, I have a special guest. He's only two feet tall. Please welcome now, 1337. I'm here to help you do a good show. Now, 1337, you're awesome. Thanks, but I will not clean your room or do your homework. <laughs> as much as I'd like to own my own little Now, 1337, I can't, because he's only available to scientists who do research on robots. Anyway, he's not really what I'm looking for, because he can't clean up my room. I can pretend to clean your room. <laughs> okay, but what about Maya's question? She wants to know if a robot's brain can hold as much information as a human's brain. Ask me any question. Hmm. Who invented the first robot? Leonardo da Vinci invented the first humanoid robot 518 years ago. Well, what about this? What's 2 trillion, 48 billion, divided by 512 billion? The answer is four. How can he know all this stuff? I have access to the internet just like any other computer. But I would love to be like Watson. I know Watson. Watson is a supercomputer. He can learn the equivalent of a million books per second, and he can actually understand them. It's called artificial intelligence. He's unbeatable at chess, and he won at Jeopardy, a super hard game show. In the future, robots will be able to use all this power, so you might think that the answer to Maya's question is yes, and that now 1337 is smarter than me. Affirmative. Well, that's not true. <gasps> Our brains can do things that robots can't. We have imagination. We can invent things, solve problems, we're creative. How would you plan a surprise party for your best friend? Error. Does not compute. <laughs> gotcha! Robots don't have an imagination, so they can't easily adapt to situations like we do. Like deciding this is a good time to answer Devante's question. Do robots work better than humans? Well, yes. Robots are much better than some humans are at some jobs because they never get tired. They repeat the same actions perfectly every time. They can work in dangerous conditions that humans would never want to be in. They don't need air. They never get bored by doing the same thing over and over again. And they never get distracted. Unless finding stuff out is on. Here's a question from Angela. How many different kinds of shapes could a robot be? It can be all kinds of shapes. Not all robots look like humans. Their shape depends on what they need to do. Robots make cars, food, and all kinds of things. Some robots help doctors do surgery. Others help soldiers carry out dangerous missions. Robots have been exploring Mars. Look, Mom, no hands. Some cars can even drive on their own. They're robots, too. 
but how do you make them? He knows how to build robots and tear them apart. Please welcome robotics engineer, Carlos Azmat. You want a robot? Well, here you go. I think I need a robot to help me build one. Carlos built this one. So, turns on. And, um, can do cool things. Like walking. <laughs> Whoa, it can go sideways too. Mm hmm. <laughs> so, that's made with like the same parts that are here on this tray. Exactly. So, first we have the mechanical parts. You see, these are like our bones. Then we have the motors. And uh, this is like our muscles. Then you have the battery. The battery is like the food you eat. And then we have one of the most important components, uh, which is the robot's brain. So this is a microchip that has all the behaviors and all the knowledge the robot needs to move and to do interesting things. So it's like the brain. Yes, exactly. Cool. And the brain connects to sensors. For instance, this is uh, an IR sensor. It's a bit like the robot's eye. So with all these parts, you can make any shape of robot you can imagine. But what about a personal robot like I want? Why don't you roll the video I brought you? All right. So you see there, the HRP4C looks like a human, can express emotions and can move around quite quickly, but cannot do any tasks yet. Then you have the RP Vita, which is a telemedicine robot, which means it allows doctors to examine their patients at a distance, so they don't need to be there. Next we have the uh, RI Man and uh, Reba, who uh, can carry patients around. Carlos says there are robots out there who can do amazing things, but they're built to do only one thing well. For a robot to do everything a human can do is nearly impossible. So it's a big jump to teach them really useful tasks around the house. Well, speaking of robots, here's a question from Evan. Why do robots do whatever we want them to do? To answer your question, they make robots do what they want. Let's hear it for the kids from Merton Elementary. These kids are robotics champions. Hey. Oh, can your robots clean my attic? No. no. But we do have lots of fun with them. All these robots are so cool, but how do you get them to do what you want them to? Well, we use a special software that we connect by a USB from our brain to the computer. Right. So each icon that we use on the software itself is a movement. It'll be moving in a square pattern. So here, the first icon I have is motor B and C. I have it going straight at power level 50 for one rotation. Then the next icon I have is just motor B, so that will pivot. Nice. Is it hard to program stuff like this? Not really. But it can get complex, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you're doing more than just a square. Mm -hmm. So do you guys want to work with robots when you're older? Well, I'm still debating between if I want to become a singer or if I still want to work with robots. Well, you could sing and build robots and design singing robots. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'd like to program robots when I'm older. Unlike Josh, <laughs> I want to build them. Maybe yeah. he can program them and you'll build them for him. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be a doctor when I'm older, but I know that robots will still be a part of my life because doctors use robots. I want to be a robotics teacher when I'm older, so I'll still use robots. I'm not sure if I want to do robots when I'm older, but I definitely want a robot. Yeah. 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 Me too. Anyway, check out these robot competitions these kids go to. Martin Elementary. Kids from Merton Elementary have competed in Canada, the United States, and even Germany, and they've won tons of awards, including three times for overall best school. All over the world, there are more and more events where kids compete using robots they've built and programmed themselves. Making robots is becoming really cool. Listen to that crowd. Speaking of competitions, it's time for... My Great Challenge! All right, so tell me about this challenge. We program the robot so that it knocks out the red balls, which we call the cherries, out of the circle. Uh, if it knocks out any cups or it leaves the circle, it's out. Right. And whichever robot knocks out the most red balls wins. So are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Go. 
Alyssa, Noah, and Sabrina's robots not only recognize the red balls and know to push them off the red circle, but they also know to avoid objects like the cups and always stop when they reach the edge of the circle. The best program robot wins. All right. So how do you win this challenge? So we programmed our robots to go up the ramp, and when it sees the white with this sensor, it will shoot the ball into the net. Kavisha and Lewis have spent a lot of time getting their robots to release their catapult at just the right spot. Yes. Got another. Uh. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Looks like you both got a basket, so it's a tie. Yeah. All right, so how does this final challenge work? Well, the robot has to follow the black line and go up the ramp. Then it has to save the monkey from the dinosaur. Whoever does it faster wins, but if your robot gets off the line, you have to wait five seconds and then put it back on. Joshua, you can go first and go. The search and rescue challenge is hard because the robots have a long way to go through ramps, twists and turns, all by themselves with no help. There. Oh, no! Ouch. All right, you did it in 50 seconds. Ben, you're up next. Are you ready? Yeah. Go. Ben's robot is off to a great start. If he keeps it up, he could easily win. But wait, oh no. Something is malfunctioning. Ben's robot seems confused and stuck. Ben is helping it up. He gets a time penalty for that and finally heads for the dangerous dino. Not again! Ouch! All right, Ben, your time was one minute plus 15 seconds because you had to pick up your robot three different times. And Josh, your time was 50 seconds, so you're the winner! Yeah! Thank you for playing my great challenge. Thank you, Harrison. I'll go on the robots dance like this. <laughs> Let's do the robot. Let's do the robot. I am so flexible. I am so rigid. My moves are smooth. My moves are chunky. My skin is bouncy. My shell is stiff. I'm full of bones, organs, and water. I'm full of plastic, metal, and microchips. Loosen up. Nothing up. You're always trying to replace me. You're always trying to control me. Let's do the robot. Let's do the robot. So, Julia, robots move in mechanical ways because they're built with motors, plastics, and metals, unlike humans. Some scientists, though, are trying to create robots that look and feel exactly like humans. Check this one out. This is the Geminoid F robot and the person it was based on. I don't know about you, but I find it kind of spooky. I thought I was the only one to feel that way, but it turns out most people feel the same. We like robots when they look funny like cartoons. Like me, I am so cute. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. When robots look funny and cute, like now 1337, we like them. We can even have feelings for them. I love you, too. Aww. But when robots actually start looking and acting like humans, we find it scary. Some scientists say that's a normal human reaction. Stefano had a question about that. Can robots be dangerous and attack us? The Flat Earth Corner! Over 200 years ago, Mary Shelley wrote a book about a scientist named Dr. Frankenstein who created a human-like creature in his lab. Science has gone way too far this time. That's way out of line. Oh, oh no, it's Dr. Frankenstein's monster! A hundred years ago, Czech writer Karol Kopeck invented the word robot, because in his language, robota means hard work. But in his book, one day, the robots don't want to just work for us anymore. They've decided to get rid of us and take over the world! Destroy mankind. 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 Destroy
destroy mankind. People who wrote those stories had a lot of imagination, but their stories are all kind of the same. Good robots that turn evil. Even today, some people are scared of robots. They think they'll turn against them or something. But robots aren't good or bad. They're just things that we made. And it's up to us to tell them not to hurt people. Be good. Speaking of being good, here's a question from Vanessa. How do robots help you in good ways? Well, Vanessa, there's actually a whole bunch of new robots that help us around the house. A lot of people already have robot vacuum cleaners or some that mop floors. How about a gutter cleaning robot? Or a pool cleaning robot? More and more service robots are invented every year. And here's the most useful service robot I know, and I'm here with its owner, Isabelle Ducharme. Hi, Harrison, this is uh, Jaco. It's, uh, to me, like a third arm. I have limited usage of my arm since an accident that happened a while ago. I'm brand new with it. I've only had it a few weeks, so I'm just learning all the things it can do with me. But among everything that it can do, I learned that I can now water my plant, which is something I couldn't do before. All right. So you can control it just with that joystick, kind of like a video game. Yes. Would you like to try it? Really awesome, yeah. It's cool. When she was younger, Isabel was unstoppable. She loved doing lots of stuff. After the accident, she wanted to stay the same. So she traveled all around the world and even went skydiving. I always look for ways to be more independent and Jaco has changed my life for that. So you wanna try and pour me a glass of water? Sure, let me try to figure out how this thing works first here. So, uh, okay. Okay, we have left. I'm used to joysticks, so I'm getting the hang of operating Jacko right away. It's not gonna squish the bottle too hard though, is it? No, no, it has sensors. It feels when it, it's grabbing onto something and it's gonna stop. You could uh, grab an egg or you could all even grab a ceramic cup. It right. will work. I'm not spilling this glass of water. No way. There we go. Perfect. Jacko is much more than a remote control. It has brains and knows to never put you in danger or pinch you. I also need a straw when I want to drink, so do you think you can grab that straw? I'll, I'll try. <laughs> okay. There we go. Uh, there we go, and now I just have to drop it in. Boom. It's cool because the robot can like move so many different ways, so you have like every possible move that you want. Like you can just like switch it and you got the wrist and the arm action and the fingers, that's awesome. Is it cold enough? Couldn't have been better. Nice. Not only now can I drink on my own, but I can also grab things when I drop them on the floor. Before, if I dropped my phone on the floor, it stayed on the floor for the rest of the day. Now I can pick it up. There are some people that can't move at all. Do you think robots will be able to help them one day? There's actually some uh, research done, and somebody managed to move Jacko with her mind. Whoa, mind control. Thanks for being on my show. It's been fun, Harrison. Robots can even shake hands. There's a lot of helpful robots out there, but they can only do one or two things. I want a robot that can do everything, just like this question that kicked off my show. When will I have my own personal robot? The big answer is... Unfortunately, we have to wait for the real deal. This robot rock band is pretty cool but all they do is play music and nothing else. Most robots are good at doing only one thing, but there is one robot I found that can be our own personal assistant, and that's PR2. A PR2 can neatly fold a towel, he can tie knots, that's really hard. He can go to the fridge and serve some drinks. Then he can play pool and even clean up dirty dishes. PR2 is the most advanced humanoid personal robot, but he costs more than a big house. He's clumsy and slow and really not ready for us. 
How long do I have to wait? Well, the good news is that there is a lot of good progress, and by the time the kids looking at this show will grow up and be adults, they'll probably have some pretty cool, useful robots around the house doing cool things. Hi. But wait, for now, I guess I have to clean up my own messes. Wait, robotic mind control. Robot Harrison, get in here. I need you to clean up the floor. Yeah, make sure to sweep it and also clean up my desk. And I also need water and a glass of milk and some cookies as well. Yes, master. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Hi, and welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I came all the way up here to the International Space Station because of this question from Veronica. Could kids go to space? I'd like to go. I want to go too. So today, I'm going to train to go to space with the help of some real astronauts. And by the end of the show, I'll be able to tell you how kids can go to space. Who's with me? Let's get some. Would these kids like to go to space? Let's find out. I'd like to go to space so that I could have no sense of direction whatsoever. So I could be the first person to plant a tree on the moon. So I could squeeze a bottle of water and just suck it up with my mouth. Like that. <laughs> well, I would so I couldn't see the sun. To discover the planet. Because then I could meet an alien. See, I already practiced. <laughs> I want to be the first kid to break dance on the moon. I don't want to go to space because I might get dumb and take off my helmet. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, don't take your helmet off in space. Anyway, here's the next question. It's from Mia. Where did astronauts get the idea to go in space? <laughs> The Flat Earth Corner! No one really knows who got the idea to go to space. But more than 200 years ago in Paris, Claude Ruggieri was the first person to try it. Step right up, folks. This is your chance to see the very first space travel. With my rocket, I'm going to send this sheep into space. <laughs> Yikes! Good thing the sheep had a parachute. But Ruggieri had bigger and better plans. Hey, you! I'll send you into outer space. Drats! The Paris police always spoiling my fun. Fortunately, the police stopped him before he had time to send a kid up in the air. His astronauts only got about as high as an office building, which isn't anywhere near space. It was a start, though. If astronauts weren't tied up in space, would they just float away? The short answer is only if they're in space. Every object creates gravity, a force that can pull other objects towards it, sort of like a magnet. So really big objects, like Earth, have a lot of gravitational force. So when you're here on the planet... Hey, get back here. Gravity pulls you back to Earth. But the further away you get, the weaker Earth's gravitational pull is until it can't reach you at all. Aww. So yes, Sabrina, astronauts would just float away if they weren't tied to their spaceship during spacewalks. Gravity can't get me when I'm traveling out in space. Can't pull my pants down or put wrinkles on my face. Cause when I am in the cosmos, far from things with gravity, I can't float around my spaceship free and nothing pulls on me. Here's a question from Andrew. How do astronauts train for zero gravity? You're probably wondering why I'm upside down. In zero gravity, it can feel like blood is rushing to your head. To find out more, 
I'm calling my friend Jeremy in Houston, who's a real astronaut in training. Hi, Harrison. Uh, I think there might be something wrong with your camera. Oh, oh no, I'm not actually upside down here. <laughs> oh, I see. You're just practicing. Yes. <laughs> well, great. That's a great way to practice. In fact, uh, sometimes I practice what it's going to be like in microgravity one day. Do you actually practice like that, though? Well, I have, yeah, but not usually. We, we have better ways of doing it. You should come try it sometime. So how do real astronauts do it? Well, we have this really cool airplane, and you get in this airplane, and it flies up into the sky, and then you're just sitting on the floor, and it does this roller coaster motion, goes down like this, and while it's diving down, you're in zero gravity. You're floating just like you're in space, and it is a ton of fun. You can fly all over the airplane. You can do flips. Uh, you can tackle your buddies. It's just a really great time. But most importantly, you get to experience what it's going to be like when you're in space. I found some video of you training in a swimming pool. What's that all about? <laughs> right over here, I've got what we use to keep ourselves alive when we're in the pool. I've got a spacesuit here. And this spacesuit, if I were to put you in it, weighs about two to 300 kilograms. So it's really hard to train with here on Earth. It's very, very heavy. But if we put it underwater, we can make it float. And that's how we simulate being in space and working in this spacesuit. It's a very cool spacesuit, allows you to do a really cool job out in the vacuum of space outside the space station, but it's also very hard to work in because it's big and bulky. Look at the size of these gloves. Imagine doing fine tasks with this. Yeah, you have like nubby fingers and stuff, it looks like too. <laughs> yeah. You know what else is important to realize is you can't scratch your nose. <laughs> I think it's worth it. Can you imagine the view of our planet from space? Small price to pay. Wow, well, being an astronaut must be pretty amazing. Thanks so much for helping me find stuff out. Hey, my pleasure, Harrison. You take care. So long. Sounds kind of hard to float around in zero gravity on a spaceship. To find out how, it's time for... My Great Challenge! Today, our challengers are Commander Joseph, and Commander Malinka. Are you ready to experience zero gravity? Yes, I am. Me too. All right, well, today you won't be leaving the planet, but you'll definitely be like you're living out on a space station where there's no gravity. You'll be strapped into this simulator. And your challenge is to bounce around, grab these Energizer cells right here, and then get all the way over to that satellite and screw them in. The one that does this the fastest will be the winner. Sound good? Yes. Commander Joseph, you're up first. Yes, sir. Good luck in space. Thank you, Commander Malenka. Go! Zero gravity is sort of like being in a bouncy castle. Oh, missing the... It's as difficult as being in real zero gravity. <laughs> He's got one. Now he has to get it to the satellite. Oh, he dropped it. In real outer space, that energy cell would be floating away forever. To the satellite. Quick, the satellite is losing power. Getting close. Does he have oh, one? He has one. He has one? Yeah, one's in. Joseph's really speeding up, unless he drops this one, too. Yes. Oh, there, he almost has it. He just has to get it in. He's got it. One minute, 25 is the time to beat. I'm ready to win. Go! <laughs> yeah, she has a good start. Hey, Malinka, don't just float around. You've got a race to win. Hurry, your spacecraft is losing power. Oh, she has it right away. Oh, does she have it? Yes. Wow, Malinka's fast. Oh, she almost missed it, though. Malinka's only got a few seconds left to beat Joseph's time. Oh, she has Wow, she's going it really fast. And does she have number two? Yes. Yeah, she has it. Okay, Commanders, here are your results. Commander Joseph, your time was one minute and 25 seconds. And Commander Malinka, your time was one minute and 20 seconds. You're the winner. Yes! <laughs> okay, so how did it feel to be an astronaut and bouncing up and down and stuff? It was really 
fun. I felt like I was wearing a big marshmallow costume. And what about you? What did it feel like? I felt like a floating pumpkin. <laughs> right, because of the orange suit? Yeah. Well, thanks for being on my show, and thanks for helping me find stuff out. You're welcome. My next question is from Cassandra. If I would be able to touch the sky, would it stop or would it continue? I checked the answer, and the atmosphere around the Earth does end eventually. Astronauts have to blast through it to go to space. But space itself goes on forever. There's no end to it. How can that be? It must have an end. But if it did end, what's outside of space? There's nothing in space but space. That getting warm, spatial overload. Ah! You're going to make my head explode. <sighs> Scientists think that space goes on forever and ever and ever. Kind of scares me to think about that. So, let's think about something else. Who was the first astronaut in space? Well, we know it wasn't Rujiri Sheep. <laughs> but I checked, and here's what I found out. The first astronauts to go up into space <laughs> and safely come back <laughs> Excuse me. were actually two Russian dogs who were sent up in a test program to make sure it was safe for humans to go into space. Sweet. Decent. <laughs> but if you mean the first human, that was Yuri Gagarin, a cosmonaut. That's a Russian word for astronaut. More than 50 years ago, in 1961, Gagarin spent 108 minutes in outer space, traveling around the Earth once. Since then, more than 500 people have been to space, some for more than a year. Zero gravity makes me sleepy. Here's a question about that. How do you sleep in space? I found out that astronauts sleep in sleeping bags attached to the wall. That's so the astronauts don't float away. Floating away in your sleep would be really bad. I thought I'd try sleeping their way, but it isn't very comfortable. At least, not here on Earth. But I found a video of astronaut Chris Hadfield explaining how it works. I'm in my super comfy Russian full-length pajamas. Nice for when you have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, ready to go to bed. I'll show you where I sleep. Astronaut Chris Hadfield is the first Canadian to walk in space and to command the International Space Station. On his last mission, he went to bed 145 times. This is my sleep station, my sleep pod. This is uh, where I spend up to eight hours every day. Astronauts squeeze a rag. Weird. Everything is just a little bit different in space, like cutting your nails over an air duct that sucks them in so they don't go flying everywhere. Getting a haircut with a vacuum hose on the cutter, and especially washing your hair, as astronaut Karen Nyberg shows us. What I like to do is start by just putting some hot water, squirting it onto my scalp. Sometimes the water gets away from you and you try and catch as much as you can. Then I just work the water up through to the ends of my hair. And I take my no rinse shampoo and squirt it also on the scalp, just a little bit, and rub it in. Again, kind of working it out to the ends. How do astronauts get their food? International Space Station. I'm here at the Canadian Space Agency with Danielle, who's a mission controller. Hi. Hey, so how do astronauts get their food? Well, there are six people living on the real space station, and every few months we launch a spacecraft with food in it. And for some of them, they go right next to the space station, and we have to grab them with a canadarm. And that's going to be your mission today. Awesome. 
So, do real astronauts train here? Yes, they do, and you're gonna be using the same simulator. Whoa. But first, let's find out about the food that you'll be delivering. For sure. Well, this is Natalie, our space food expert, and this is Harrison, our delivery boy. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Well, I'm gonna go and set up the simulator. All right. Are you hungry? Whoa, <laughs> look at all this food. Oh, some of it doesn't look very good. It looks kind of weird, like, what is this? This is macaroni and cheese, so this is just like the macaroni and cheese you have on Earth, except the water's been taken out of it. So when an astronaut's ready to eat it, all he does is put hot water right here, wait 10 to 15 minutes, like it says on the instructions, right. and then you cut this open, and you can just eat it out of, out of the package, and like out of a bowl. It'll taste as good as it does on Earth? It'll be delicious. Nice. <laughs> so what can astronauts not eat in space? Any food that makes crumbs. Oh, so they can't eat, like, cookies? Well, they can eat some cookies, as long as those cookies don't make crumbs. And this is an example of cookies that they could eat in space. These are actually crackers, but they're bite-sized, so you could put them in your mouth in, in right. one bite, and you won't make any crumbs. So what's the problem with crumbs floating around in space, though? They can get into equipment, and that can damage the equipment, which can be a problem. Or they can get into an astronaut's eye, oh. not very comfortable. <laughs> or they can breathe them in and get them into their lungs, which can be a problem, too and we don't want them to choke. Right, that'd be bad. Yeah. So what other foods can they not eat in space? They don't normally eat fresh fruit and vegetables. There's not a lot of refrigeration up there, so there's nowhere to keep the fruit and vegetables fresh. So we have to send them um, dried fruit and vegetables. So for example, this is dried cranberries. Right. It's packaged in packages like this, or it can be in a bar. For example, this is a fruit bar, yeah. and that's another way to get fruit to the astronauts. Nice. But sometimes astronauts might want a little snack. Like. What about these chocolates? They get chocolate in space? They do. Nice. So that's cranberries covered in chocolate. Mm. These are out of this world. They're pretty good, very popular. So I think Danielle's waiting for you to deliver some food to some hungry astronauts. Oh, all right. Let's deliver some food. OK. This is a model of the end of the Canadarm. You're going to use that to go and grab the spacecraft okay. by the spin that we see right here right. and here. So you're going to do that using these two hand controllers or joysticks. Uh, this Danielle showed me how to work the simulator. Left, right. I have to move the Canada arm so that the end locks onto the pin on the shuttle. Then the arm can dock to the space station. Wow, I think I'm gonna be good at this because of the years of experience of video games I have. Well, let's see. How many tries do I get? Since we're only training as many as you want, in real life, you only get one shot. One shot. Let's see if I can do it in one try. Okay, you're ready to go. There we go. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Wow. Are astronauts normally good at this? Well, some of them are. Uh, the ones that used to be fighter pilots tend to be really good. But then there are some that are doctors and scientists and really never had time to play video games. So you might actually be better than them. Whoa. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Getting close. Whoa, OK. I'm almost there. You're doing really well. You're getting closer. Whoa. Standing by for grapple confirmation. Robotic arm finishing, closing in. Now. Did it work? Did I get, yeah. Uh, Dragon confirmed in place and docked to the International Space Station at the Harmony Node. I got it. Well, mission accomplished. Now the astronauts can eat. I'm like a real astronaut now, sort of. We could make an astronaut out of you, I think. Well, thanks for being on my show. Do you think I could really be an astronaut one day? Uh, sure, if you apply yourself, get a good education, and you definitely have the video game part down, so uh, good luck. Thanks. This is awesome. Hey, I've got a call. It's from Jeremy. Hey, Harrison. Good to see you again. They told me you were at the Canadian Space Agency training with him on Canada Arm 2. Yeah, they said that I could apply to be an astronaut someday, but is it possible for a kid like me to go to space right now? Well, not right now, Harrison, but one day. Oh, I guess I can answer the question that started us off. Could kids go to space? I'd like to go. The big answer is... 
apparently we can't. No, no, hang on, Harrison. That's not it at all. But I thought you said you couldn't take kids with you. Well, that's partially correct. We're not taking kids to space right now. But one day, when those kids get older, they can definitely be astronauts, and we're going to need astronauts to fly in space. There are amazing things happening in space right now. We have liftoff of Falcon 9. Dragon is sent for stage acceleration. In fact, for the first time in history, commercial companies are building new rockets to take people to space. And more and more people are going to be flying in space in your lifetime. In fact, I think one day, it's going to be kids who are about seven, ten years old that'll be the first humans to walk on Mars. Whoa, that's awesome. So I guess the astronauts of the future are kids today. Absolutely. You know what you have to do if you want to be an astronaut? You just have to do your very best. That's all you have to do. Find out what you love to do in life, follow that passion for the things you love, and just do your best. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on my show. I'm going to go train right now. On the job training, there's nothing like it. But being in space makes me hungry. Time for a space snack. Ah, oh, pesky helmet. Uh oh. Note to self don't dig helmet off in space. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I hope I didn't startle you. I've got a mysterious situation on my hands, so I'm starting the show off with this question from Charles. What clues do police need to figure out a crime? Charles, I don't know the answer to that, honestly. The lie detector even says so, but by the end of the show, I'll have an answer, because I'm gonna solve a mystery of my own. It all started when I set my lunch bag down this morning to check that I hadn't forgotten my banana. Ah, there you are. But when I came back at lunchtime... What? Who took a bite of my sandwich? <laughs> now I have a mystery to solve, but help is on the way. She knows how to investigate and to figure out who ate part of my sandwich. Please welcome Detective Paula Esposito. Hi, Harrison. What seems to be the problem? It's been crazy, and it's my sandwich. Mm -hmm. Someone took a bite of it, but I don't know who. Can you help me figure it out? I can help you, Harrison. But the first things detectives do is they ask questions. All right. So, who has access to this room? Just me and my family. Where was your sandwich left before you noticed somebody took a bite out of it? I was sitting here the whole time. What kind of cheese is this? Cheddar. Cheddar? Oh, I love cheddar. Was your family at the house today? I think so, yeah. Do you have any suspects in mind? Probably my sister. OK, well, that's a good start. Charles was asking what kind of clues a detective needs to solve a crime. Well, I could show you how we would investigate if this were a real crime. The first thing I need to do is figure out if there were witnesses to this crime. This gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challengers are Annabelle. Yay! Adriano. Oh, yeah. And Sarah. Yay. <laughs> so today, I'm going to put your power of observation and memory to the test. You're all going to be eyewitnesses. Are you ready? Yes. So I'm going to play a clip here, and you'll see something, but I can't tell you what it is. Because you know eyewitnesses at a crime scene, they don't know what they're about to see. Here we go. Challengers, we're going to ask you questions separately so you don't hear each other's answers. Because we don't want witnesses influencing each other. So Animal, going to interview you first. Adriano and Sarah, you can step out for a minute. A 
boy took a bicycle in that scene. What did he look like? Well, he had black uh, hair, short hair. Mm -hmm. I'm not really, I don't remember what, what color his shirt was. Mm -hmm. I think he had beige pants. I'm like, he had a mask on, a gray mask. He looked like, like he didn't steal it at all. What color was the bike? It was red. I think it might have been red or something. Black. Who else was on the street? There was a guy in a motorcycle. There was a, um, a mom and a dad that were like at the neighbor's house. There was the dad raking some leaves and there was three kids uh, playing uh, basketball. I think I saw somebody else walking by. What were they doing? Uh, doing something else, I just forget what. There's this guy that was there riding a motorcycle. Okay. Tell me, did you see anything unusual? There was a, a, some, a kid with a, a alien mask and a big red robe. Like I saw somebody walk by and they had like an, another weird mask on. Some people from Halloween and um, the alien that had the mask on there, mm -hmm. um, when it was going, it was walking too fast at the same time. All right, as your final test, you're gonna have to pick who you think took the bike using what police call a lineup. A lineup is simply a bunch of pictures, and you're gonna determine whether the suspect who took the bike is on it or he's not on it. Remember to not call out your answer. All right, everybody close your eyes and hold up the number that you think it is. So, you can all open your eyes now. Actually, nobody got it right. In fact, it was number four who took the bike. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> But, oh, man. but you were great witnesses, all of you, because you all had different things that you did see. And Annabelle, you got the most things right. So that would make her... The winner! Congratulations! Yay, Annabelle! Clap, clap, clap. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being on my show, and stay out of trouble, because I don't want to have to pick you out of a lineup, okay? Don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. Well, I gotta go now, because I have a big case to take care of. However, I will send to you my forensic expert so he can take all the evidence on that sandwich bite. And I'll be back later, and I'll explain all the clues to you. All right, thanks. See you later. Bye, detective. Bye. See you later. Bye. Chances are, if you played along at home, you also forgot lots of details and made mistakes. Most eyewitnesses are unreliable. That's why investigators like having lots of them to help find out the truth. Sometimes, there are no witnesses to a crime except for the criminals. So, throughout history, detectives have developed other ways of looking for clues. Some are smart, others, not so much. <laughs> the Flat Earth Corner! <laughs> uh -huh. There's a big bump! In the Victorian era, almost 200 years ago, scientists thought by measuring bumps and dips on people's heads, they could tell how big the areas of their brains were underneath. They thought certain areas of the brain made people criminals. Aha! Uh -huh. Obviously guilty. I am the very model of an expert in phrenology. Feeling heads for lumps and bumps, the signs of criminality. Fibbing, cheating, misbehavior, shoplifting, delinquency. Wrongdoers will be revealed by nodules or concavity. So if you seek a culprit, trust me, I can solve the mystery. I'll catch a lumpy head and comfort of stolen from Marjorie. Phrenology wasn't a real science. Turns out you can't tell a person's character from the shape of their skull. Now here's a question from Xavier. What kind of equipment does the police use to solve a crime? To help solve my sandwich mystery, please welcome investigator Carl Benson. <laughs> Hey. Detective Esposito told me you needed help with the crime scene? Yeah, someone took a bite of my sandwich and I was hoping you could help me figure out who did it. Why are you taking a picture of the sandwich? Well, Harrison, the first thing we're gonna do on a crime scene is take pictures to make sure we record all the evidence. What other equipment do you use at a crime scene? Well, right here we have a kit and inside the kit we'll have everything we need to uh, collect fingerprints and also collect DNA evidence. I think Taya had a question about that. How do investigators detect DNA? 
Carl says that DNA is sort of like the recipe of who we are. It's everywhere in our bodies, and every person's DNA is different. So if investigators can get DNA from someone's hair or skin or even spit, they can usually tell who it's from. In the case of your sandwich, we're gonna try to uh, pick up spit on the bite mark. Right, and why are we wearing these gloves and masks? Well, we want to make sure we don't contaminate the sandwich with our own DNA. Well, then let's find some DNA on this sandwich. Okay, so I'll show you how. Right here we have a swab. We open this like this. And open the tip. Okay. Okay, take out the tip. I'm just gonna put a few drops of water on the tip here. What I want oh. you to do is just take hold the swab, like hold the plastic part here. Okay. Just take a swab of Around the bite mark. Bite. Yeah. So, just take so that. we're gonna try to pick up spit like that. Close the tip. Just like okay. that. Down. Put it in this bag. Yeah. Cool. And first. And, and that's now it's it. Sealed. And now we'll sealed. send it off. Send it off to the crime lab. <laughs> All right. I have another question. It's from Stefano. Really? Sometimes I kind of wonder how detectives analyze fingerprints so well that they can actually catch the culprit. Yeah, when my sister steals my chocolate bars, she leaves her fingerprints all over my stuff. But I don't see any here. That's right. But the person that opened your sandwich case here probably left a fingerprint on it. To see if there's fingerprints, we're gonna use this little uh, brush here. So we're gonna put just a little bit of powder. Right. And just gonna do a little light touch like this. Okay. So we're gonna do it on the... Uh, so you're barely touching it. Okay. So grab some powder. Just like that? Yeah, just a little lower. Looks like there's a fingerprint there. That's right. Yeah, there's one right there. So now what do we do? We're just gonna put a little sticker next to it. So this is a little ruler. Right. So we can measure the fingerprint. Like this. Then what we're gonna do is take a picture of, again, to record the evidence. Okay. To show that we found a fingerprint. That's right. And we're gonna take a close-up picture. Then what we're gonna use is a lifter like this. So I'm gonna show you how to use it. Okay. All right. And peel it off like this. I'm gonna use a little roller like this. Okay. Then put it on. Roll it on like this. And then we're gonna lift it up. Okay. Now and I'm gonna like give grab it to you. It, like grab yeah. the fingerprint. Yeah. Grab the powder and the fingerprint. Cool. So I'm gonna want you to roll this on. Okay. So I'm just gonna give it All to right. you like this. Okay. Just put it down on the table. So we just put it like. Like that? Like that? Yeah, I'm just gonna roll it on. Roll it on. With this. So really hard. Yeah. Just push it hard. Just like that. There you go. Should I get an extra one? <laughs> there we go. Now you just recorded the evidence. You nice. have your fingerprint. And now it's not gonna be messed with because it's in this like plastic thing, That's right? That's right, it's protected now. All right. Thanks for being on my show and helping me collect evidence. No problem, Harrison. I'll bring this back to the lab, I'll analyze it, and I'll uh, give the results to Detective Esposito. All right, here's another investigation question. This one's from Amalia. Why do police use dogs? I mean, they're cute and everything, but what do they do? Well, Amalia, to find out, I'm here at my neighborhood police station. And here's Constable Sue McLeod. Hey. Hi, Harrison. This is my partner, Uno. Oh. Unfortunately, Harrison, I'll have to ask you not to pet him because he's not a pet. He's a working dog, and it's only me who's allowed to handle him. Right. So, why do police use dogs? Police use dogs because of their sense of smell. It's amazing. Uno's specialty is tracking human scent. He can find humans, and above that, he can find articles that are lost or hidden and that contain human scent. Oh, that gives me an idea. I'll go hide some of my things and put you to the test. <laughs> The three items I'm gonna hide are my drumsticks, this teddy bear that I probably once loved, and my favorite sunglasses. I'm ready. Ready? Go find it. Oh, look at him sniffing the trail. Oh. Where is it? Show me. He found it. Hit. This is his reward. He gets excited. What he's found is a little stuffy. Are you yeah. guessing that you put that there, Harrison? Yes, it's an old teddy Good bear. Boy. And now we're having a little celebration. I had a boy. That's so you do this cool. every time he finds one? Every time. So then he becomes more excited to find the next one. Had a boy. Oh, yeah, he found my sunglasses. 
Quick, get out of the boy. Woohoo! Good dog. Check out Uno. He's trained to sit down when he finds a piece of evidence. Oh! Is that what is? a boy. <laughs> wow, Uno found them so easily and so quickly. How much better can dogs smell compared to humans like us? Well, it's believed that a dog can smell up to 10,000 times better than a human being. Just for an example, Harrison, if you walk into a flower shop, mm -hmm. all you're smelling is flowers. You don't know an individual flower. Right. Where a dog like Uno, he would know there's a rose there, there's a tulip there, there's a chrysanthemum over here. He knows each individual smell. So do you think if I went to hide outside somewhere that Uno would be able to find me off of my smell? Absolutely, because your smell is only your smell. It's like a fingerprint. Nice. Uno, let's go play some hide and seek, see if you can find me. Why is he barking? Oh, he's barking because he's excited. He knows he gets to go to work, and work is play. Right. OK, you know, let's go. OK, Harrison, well, here we are. A lot of area for you to run and hide. So whenever you're ready, why don't I just count to 100, give you a good head start? All right, but don't watch. No, we won't watch. OK, I'm going to go. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven. Sausages. This will throw them off. Hell yeah. All right. Air freshener. He's never going to find me. 98. 99, 100. You can't mask your human scent. It comes out of the bottom of your shoes, it comes off your pants, it comes out of your hair, your ears, everywhere. Your scent is falling out and off of you. And it falls to the ground and it's perfect for a dog. There you go. Good boy. Let's go. <laughs> nice try, Harrison. If he ever finds me, I'll eat my shirt. Show me. I mean, I mean a sandwich. Harrison, Uno says that you're inside the garden shed. Come on out. Ah, uh, Uno, you found me. Good dog. Well, Uno, you did it. He sure did. And after each success, when something like this goes down, I always kind of try to give him a treat. Here, Uno. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks so much for being on my show. Now here's a question from Kira. How do lie detectors work? That gives me an idea to get some. What I want to know is how can you tell if somebody is lying? You can tell if someone's lying because maybe they're smiling. <laughs> maybe what they're saying is like, can be realistic. Like, as you said, my dog ate my homework. It's like, it can be possible, but it's probably not. <laughs> they kind of look up and stutter like they don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> they sort of look away from the person they're talking to. <laughs> well, they're acting kind of like, Weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might be fumbling with their hands. Well, they might have a slight um a hesitation to their voice. <laughs> okay, okay. So raise your hands if you've never lied before. Oh. Are you willing to take a lie detector test? No. no. no, no. Lie detectors are machines that measure things like how fast our heart beats and changes in the way we breathe. The idea is that telling lies will make our body react differently than when we tell the truth. But nowadays, experts don't think that lie detectors can really tell us if people are lying or not for sure. So I can't use it to find out who took a bite of my sandwich. <laughs> but never fear, cause help is here. Please welcome back Paula Esposito. 
Listen, because this case is so important, I was able to get the lab results back quickly. I can't wait! So, is the answer in that folder? Actually, Harrison, the answer is in this folder. And frankly, I'm not that surprised. Because, you know, detectives have to put their intuition and all the evidence together to figure out the whole puzzle. Right. So the fingerprints and the DNA match a member of your family. I bet it's my sister. Mm, close, but no. My dad? You're getting warmer. My mom? Absolutely not. Squeakers! I had no idea a guinea pig could take a bite that big. <laughs> guinea pig? That's certainly not guinea pig DNA. But there's only me left. That's right. It was you, Harrison. It was me? But how? I don't even remember taking a bite of that sandwich. And if I don't remember, how could it be me? And getting warm? But I'm innocent, right? Ah! You're gonna make my head in! Could it really have been me? There's other clues that detectives use. Surveillance cameras. And from what I see, there's lots of cameras in your attic. So maybe one was on. You're right. Let's take a look. See? I was studying that crazy phrenology head, and the sandwich box is closed. But, hey, wait. What is this? It can't be. Let's watch that again. Wow, I can't believe it was me this whole time. Anyways, thanks for being on my show and for helping me investigate. My pleasure, Harrison. Now it's time to answer the question that sent me on this clue-filled investigation. What clues do police need to figure out a crime? Well, Charles, the big answer is... Lots! Detectives use witnesses, fingerprints, DNA, and other types of evidence, too. But the most important may be the detective's gut instinct. Speaking of gut instincts, where did I put that banana? See you next time for more.